Hello everyone, a question and answer video today about Kriegsspiel and war games. Um, it says, do you think you would ever do a video on Kriegsspiel and war games more broadly? I know you often call certain sentiments in brackets wargamistic when they are too narrow to really be all that important for a greater relevance in historiographical understanding, but are just easy to see for a casual eye. It would be interesting to hear your thoughts on wargaming more broadly and conceptually, its origins and beyond, especially since you deal largely with von Clausewitz's theory and the genesis of modern war games seems to have grown up in the milieu of that historical figure in the early 19th century Prussia. Of course, it's dealing with 19th century, which seems to be a little outside your sphere of focus of more medieval and antique tick stuff. I guess it's also a bit more of a theory topic when you than your, uh, your usually historical one as well. Well, starting from the end, yes, it's a more theoretical one, but up to a couple of years ago I used to do a lot of videos on von Clausewitz and military theory as well, right? And they were, I think, some of my finest content, uh, albeit was scarcely understood um, uh, and appreciated because I, I was mostly just commenting and crit criticizing on, on von Clausewitz, you could immediately say, you know, today I talk about, I don't know, the gods, and I uh, got plenty of views, and then I talk about what von Clausewitz says about this thing, yeah, okay, half of the views or whatever. Um, so after the restructuring of the channel two years ago, I began to make more history videos all in a row uh, to just boost uh, the channel's growth further, but this channel is technically still and mostly and fundamentally about such uh, topics because um, I had, as we'll be explaining now, an experience with, say, a part of wargaming, very timidly, right, uh, in, or actually very narrowly, but very poorly, like I haven't, I can't say I'm a wargamer, never really played war games, uh, never gotten particularly interested in them. Uh, and I have mixed feelings towards them, uh, as towards any kind of, say, simulation, which this stuff is supposed to be of, and of course, real event, uh, and especially historical ones. Of course, they are games as well, so there is uh, a very important aspect that uh, represents the same second person, the Clausewitzian Trinity, in the measure of the gamble that is. Um, associated with the military, right? This taste for, uh, not for bloodshed, like the primitive hatred that the, the people has, or the the rationale um, of of the government, uh, the political person, but literally the rolling of the dice. And so let's see what happens, right? Let's let's try it. Um, and let's try to handle it uh, in the process. So this video is probably going to disappoint. Um, anyone who's listening to it thinking that, including the author of the question probably, regarding the, um, say, wargamism per se, or the history of wargaming as such. I could actually make a video about that. I, 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 I can't, right? But given this format, like, it will be another, non, not a question and answer video as such, it will be dealt with in, in different ways. And it's always a matter of nuisance. Actually, I am. It, it, these are good questions to pose because they're objectively, um, you know, important to make. Lots of people who are also part of this community. Uh, of, I mean, the war gamistic one, as much as it could be reenactment or, or historical martial arts. I know they're very different things, um, and almost sacrilegi uh, sacrilegiously, I'm, I'm, I'm putting them together. But that simulative aspect of the story is obviously and deeply connected with the historical one. And so, given that I'm a historian myself and I specialize in, in warfare, um, I and I have looked at different aspects of wargaming, I think uh, it's important for me to point out, you know, I'm passant through this, say, inspired by these questions, certain aspects that uh, can be helpful. Because, again, I'm not a war gamer, so I'm not the best person to ask for specific aspects of war gaming, not specifically the historical ones of how they originated, 
whatever. Um, so yes, I would do a video on Kriegspiel and, and wargaming more broadly. Right? We have to understand, however, say wh what is the that breadth uh, herself? Because um, you know, wargaming can space from the actual Kriegspiel, which eventually got down to sort of um, traditional practice, yes, that was experimented with games invented by Prussian generals during the 19th century and improved over time, um, etc. Um, but it, it, it reaches literally any kind of, it, it reaches history it, herself in the measure, in which, not just methodologically, but in the measure in which, for example, we try to reconstruct a battle which is what I do for a living specifically. Um, and, uh, and I mean it because, I mean, I specialize exactly in that, uh, in, in tactics, right? That's why I wrote 700 pages just of, of, of doctoral thesis on um, regarding to medieval warfare, but the method helps to, to understand uh, way more things. And that, that's a very interesting point to start from for, because, for example, I in my research, I documented some tactics that were employed in a time that you would think, you know, in, under the sunlight, right, the late 13th, early 14th century, Western Europe, etc., that instead have been missed historiographically. That's not a problem of gaming or wargaming, whatever. It, it is a historiographical problem. It's a cultural problem. But whenever I open some war games books, some of which are very good, Right, um, even in terms of historical research, etc., and I realized that the entire thing is, of course, more or less balanced towards, for example, certain, um, certain, say, topics, certain times and spaces, because, of course, the guys who research that are people determined by time and space that come from a country uh, rather than another, that have studied that work rather than another, or that haven't studied a work because it's never been written about a topic. And so they are all influenced um, by that. And in that sense, wargaming, which um, I'm, I'm really ignorant in, uh, say, the, the degree of uh, wargaming community nowadays. I suspect it's, it's not really um, uh, a particularly um, uh, florid field. Uh, I, even if there were l really lots of people involved in it, I think that there's been a drastic uh, decrease in that, if anything, just because um, uh, you you don't see this... I, I don't know wargaming... I, I downloaded really a lot of stuff over the years about warfare, um, say, military history, military in general, and all the, say, most famous... Uh, magazines, the ones that really mixed a very high degree of historical accuracy with these games at the end, uh, were a bit of a mix of history book and then I made a game for it and you have all the, the platform, the, the rules, etc. at the end. Um, they, they are very interesting. To only I mean, I, I've never gotten interested in the games. I never tried to play them because I think it's a waste of time for the reasons I will explain now. Uh, and I'm probably not the, the kind of person who gets into that. Um, but, of course, they existed in a time in which I think people had a, a very specific, say, they were coming from a very specific place with that, meaning that um, it was, like, pretty well, say, not necessarily well-educated, but still people with a sound military historical interest that cared also in a time before the internet in finding as much information as possible, creating communities that would be would provide with this insight, knowledge, and um, seriousness in the reconstruction of military historical affairs. Um, this is mostly happening uh, mostly happening in the Anglosphere, right? I'm not aware as a continental European how developed this thing really was. I, I remember once. I was um, it was like ten years old. I went with my mother at um, at a, um, uh, it was an expo of some sort of uh, in fact this kind of of, of tin soldiers something like that. Um, but it was just a war gaming thing, and in fact that's I think the first time I I got acquainted with with the existence of war gaming, 
which I didn't understand at the time because I liked very much like having lots of different toy soldiers and playing with them and I've always treasured even today as a PhD in medieval warfare that experience as a child um, from a moral uh, almost spiritual cultural um, point of view than having gotten in those um, kind of hyper you know uh, detailed mechanisms so I and I remember I was there with, with my mother. My mother began to talk with a, one of these guys that was at these stands um, with the, the soldiers and all. And she said, like, oh, my, my son likes to play with those, uh, say, those plastic soldiers, etc. And, and this guy was all kind of strange and acid and said, oh, those are not, nor funny, nor, nor historical. And, you know, you know, here we're doing, like, he didn't say that. But the idea is that, of course, I was just a stupid kid that I didn't understand um you know the the great deal of historicity of of this stuff um and i mean that guy was was just you know just being himself probably to to, to a degree I, I i don't mean that i took this to to represent the the, the war gaming uh, community as a whole but that gave me immediately the impression especially in the way i, I was very interested in dioramas and all this stuff i used to buy uh, all sprays. So when I was was a child, I already had all sprays, and I liked uh, together with this, the the steam soldiers attached. Um, and and I really love pictures, of course, like mostly kids do. And they um, and I wasn't very interested in the historical content, admittedly, because it seemed too too, too specific, especially when they were iconic uh, troops of some sort, and there wasn't much of an action. So, but I like. Uh, pictures I, I like to reproduce um, the the same imagery with some in some game that I was doing with my classmates um, at the time but I never thought oh my god I want to enter that uh, world I even began to accumulate catalogs of with all these pictures of tanks and airplanes etc but it, again I wasn't expert historically on the thing I, I could like them I, as I liked I don't know uh, war movies on TV or uh, you know, and just I didn't have the the actual theoretical um, you know, historical background to to claim. And at that point, I didn't even know I would become a historian, of course, um, etc. Um, and over time, I say when I began to study seriously um, history, military history, I would say in my late teenage, early twenties, and. Uh, later on, I, I met with this mentor who passed away uh, years ago, um, untimely, right? Especially in this case, um, that uh, was actually a war gamer. Like he, he wouldn't present himself as such. I discovered the extent to which he was. I think only after he died. Um, but we all knew him as uh, an academic, even though he was not a historian, and um, yet somebody that knew a lot and probably better than than anyone else in our eyes uh military history of course it was it wasn't true but objectively i ever i never met uh such um uh, say military shaped mind like the one of that person i definitely don't have it in the same way i think i develop good um historical skills just because of my path my curriculum um, etc. And I understand now that, of course, I'm more advanced than than even in some topics, at least than most people that even study, research them uh, for a lifetime. Because I specifically chose a certain path, and through that, you know, when when you rise to to some of that level, you start understanding the implication of that knowledge. It is to say, you may not know about a certain field, but uh, given the complexity that you had to make sense of at a certain point you realize that certain games say certain things certain studies certain activities it may be serious studies by serious scholars academics etc are not serious enough right when you read i don't know a, a a book about a battle that you reconstructed and in in tactical detail it's literally a book about a battle so what should be aside from the historical context the campaign the actual clash and you have people knowing even way more sources than you, but not even making the effort of reconstructing tactically the battle by cross comparing, you know, analyzing the the sources and just skip that because it's too complicated. 
and they think they wouldn't even, you know, they would ruin their book in a sense. Well, that's why you understand the limits of so many initiatives, and especially the concept of simulation. I will try to explain this, right? Actually, uh, I'm toying from quite a while on the, um, let's say, on the topic of artificial intelligence, which does not exist, but surely will change a big deal um, quite soon, also in these worlds. Um, and it's definitely uh, overrated to some degree that perhaps I will explain in, in, in some other um, uh, video. But that has to do with, with today's topic because it, it is by which degree are you, will, are you, are you willing to think that a, that a machine is able to be relied upon at certain levels of historical inquiry, right? One thing is speeding up, making it easier, etc. But let's say how do we make somebody believe that that is the standard, right? And that's a question that maybe they, surely artificial intelligence can even outclass humans in certain things. In history, it's complicated, but say, let, again, let's leave this aside. But, you know, my first concern when, when I look at things like wargaming and, you know, what, whatever is in it, etc., the first thing is what do they actually think? What, what's their mind about, right? And I think that's a capacity that only humans really have um, to understand one another and um, most of the times it just meets with limits as I was saying you can have even experts in a certain field academically that you would think this guy is the best right so he actually thinks the same thing that any other person who has that that high of a knowledge will think very often it's not the case people tend to have very different opinions about lots of things even the ones that are very close to them it's mostly a matter of method, it's a matter of what they may have read or not read, um, and it's sometimes very difficult to make them, you know, realize where where they are mistaken, right? This can, you know, backfire saying, how, how do you know that you are not mistaken, right? So you have to provide with an answer, and uh, it's also the reason why I make such long videos in the first place, because whenever I think, say, uh, to, at least I have an opinion, I want to speak I want to be clear about it, right? I don't just leave everything to, or something, or even the small things to just ran, some random interpretation. And even when I make these long reflections, uh, I, I, I realize that I forcefully leave a lot of stuff out, right? And I can assure you that when you study history, that, that happens continuously, because the more in depth, again, you go, the more you realize how much you're skipping normally of all the rest. Right, and you are aware of that. Just think, the common person is not even aware that this this is a thing. Um, so the question here says, I know you often call certain sentiments war gameistic when they are too narrow to really be all that important for a greater relevance in historiographical um, understanding, but are just easy to see for a casual eye. Well, this is, of course, like most of what is pointed out here. Uh, quite poignant because uh, first of all when I use the term war game mystic what I, I refer to is is the idea that there is a sort of fixed predetermined categorical classifiable condition that you can historically verify about a certain average standard uh, quantity or quality um, uh, that uh, eventually becomes, again, it's just to make banal examples, like it, 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 to make you understand how shaded the thing is. Arms and armor, right? We live in a technologistically biased culture or subculture at this point, right? That is to say, we think normally that warfare is a matter of engineering rather than moral forces. Um, and so uh, this is something like a meme that... Um, is sadly still, uh, let's say, not even one, because it's still alive out there. For those who have eyes to see, at least to, to realize it is the case, if you go to any YouTube uh, channel, for example, about Hema at Similia, and read the comments right under those videos and say, but what do you think, you know would win between an army equipped all with halberds and one equipped all with swords or you know you, we have all this kind of uh, sort of um, 
you know, sense that we want to set, that's wargamism to me, you know, you want to set the standard, you know, forces, a, a certain categorically uh, ordained and uniformed realities to clash against one another, essentially eliminating exactly what the purpose of simulation should be. That is to say, that thing in reality would never exist, right? Nor if it existed, the people would have to fight would have an actual reason to do so in those conditions. This is a bit like the problem of Deadliest Warrior, all that kind of stuff that had, in fact, um, I think a lot of grip uh, among not war gamers, uh, specifically, of course, a war gamer would feel poss- hopefully antagonistic towards this stuff, but not completely abandon it, meaning that he, they would perhaps. Uh, Um, just criticize the level of superficiality of it. But as far as, you know, what in my booklet are the stats about how this unit works in the field, that's that's it, right? must be historical, right? The distance between, I don't know, a legionnaire and another uh, in a Roman legion. We have only two sources, historically, that give us a figure, Polybius and Vegetius. That was just another short, uh, yesterday I said, that sounded something like um, Roman uh, legionnaires were outnumbered also when they weren't, because this guy was making the point that uh, what Polybius gives as a distance, which is a very, between a legionnaire and another, which is almost an open order, differently from the Jetsus one, which is basically a phalanx, um, would make a clash between, uh, I don't know, a a middle republican um, legion against uh, a phalanx that was, according to, to other figures, more compact than that, that order that Polybius refers for uh, for the manipulator um, legion uh, nairs. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, unequal, right? And so uh, Romans were outnumbered even when they weren't. I'm actually a proponent uh, of the, the the fact that Romans were often outnumbered in general. I mean, they literally conquered the world out of a single city. And so there are lots of anti-Romanists out there that make the point that Rome had infinite resources and other people's, nobody knows why, they just, you know, sit there being beaten because otherwise, you know, they, they could have simply, you know, outclassed the Romans in other way. You, you, it's a it's part of the same problem. Like, these people do not, altogether, right, the, the entire um, failure of uh, a person, historically speaking, is to try to pretend and to convince themselves uh, that are perfectly aware of their own ignorance, by the way, and that they wouldn't behave like this otherwise, that everything gets down to a very few uh, factors that can be made sense of mathematically. Uh, And so betraying not just the, the dignity of the average human intelligence, but also demonstrating not to have the palest idea of what politics, war, and society are, are supposed to be in the first place. Of course, if a person makes these points, it means, first of all, that they have never reconstructed a battle, right? They've never read ancient sources. They have never actually even read articles on this. And, and be aware of the fact that none of these preconditions is satisfactory right uh it's not by reading just that you acquire a historical expertise it's it's not just but even by researching again you can't have done everything like in the formal cur- curricula academic curriculum and still not getting certain things and making serious mistakes and i have tons of example to bring to you right like i don't know the Asinine one of Connolly, who translated uh, Long K from the Lub translator as Macedonian Sarisai, basically, and transformed the, the Carthaginian army in, in a, one of pikemen. Um, uh, and, uh, and every moron copied that, and you have actual, you know, uh, all sprays of stuff that show this guy's like Sarisophoroi, right, in, in a Carthaginian phalanx, right? And so that's the degree of, um, let's say, of, let, that's the degree by how disastrously wrong you, you can be just by not considering a single factor, of course, of the enormous ones that will exist. So first of all, history um, humbles you very much. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of war gamers out there that say the, Roman le- the distance between a Roman legionnaire and another in the front line was the one that Polybius said 
because it's the only figure that we have and so it must be true and it must be real because this guy could have not written this for any other reason um, and maybe not even actually appreciating the Roman military history that Polybius to, to, a, to a great degree understood um, and not understanding it in the sense that he was a Greek and how Greeks reasoned and why he gives that measure for example and what for and just knowing in the broader um, complexity of the historical criticism how irrelevant if you want that that figure really is aside from the fact that we have plenty of um, of uh, of sources um, Roman and non-Roman that tell us how of course uh, the legionnaires switched order depending on you know the circumstances um, so in in any case, uh, and and we don't know any literally anything about that, right? You know, aside from uh, from these two sources, we literally do not have any other type of information that gives us any certainty whatsoever about, say, which distance existed between a legion and another. Now, what say, we're gaming definitely does not do is um, just by by i would say by rules uh, by game rules is of course having any qualification about these topics right some people who write the rules of course know this some people who uh, of course um you know have a, a broader insight in history in general realize that uh, where gaming is rigged because it's just a simulation we do not have even remotely the the the, capa the hope to replicate reality in a satisfactory way to say well this simulates it to an important degree um which um is the one that you really need to and bear in mind that i loved for example flight simulators i believe those are fairly like this you can definitely accept for the sake of gaming uh, the approximation and Flight simulators are very realistic, after all. Um, and I've always liked games that try to simulate more. I modified certain video games. Uh, I tried to make them more realistic. And I knew it was just because, for the sake, for the game's sake. It was not, it was for entertainment, it was for personal enjoyment. It was not for pretending that that is to be used as, okay, this is history. Unfortunately, and this is I'm not saying that this is a prerogative of wargaming. Um, I'm saying that in my uh, experience, virtually every person that I've met in wargaming, in reenactment, in HEMA, so I'm cramming them together to make you understand how actually general this thing is, and more in general, the average person that I've ever met talking about warfare makes essentially the same mistakes right now i understand that the question here is not about say what i think about these communities or whether i i know so well but I, I really don't i just see that again there is no qualification to be a historically educated person right and because very often as i meet constantly you know not even people with a degree or even a, a doctorate in history are actually reliable about this topic. So you must have a very specific preparation. And sometimes war gamers do have it. It's not to say that, um, say sometimes meaning that it can't happen. One to have there are beautiful books, uh, war gaming, um, say history books that are not aimed at setting rules. And surely there is a co it's not a coincidence. And just tell you know what kind of more or less of unit types existed at the time. There are beautiful ones made, especially about the Middle Ages, um, that do not pretend to say, okay, so now let's play the game. No, they they just basically approximate to some degree by saying, well, these were the kind of s sort of types of troops that you could inspire yourself to if you would like to play war gaming, which actually are very good also for you know getting to know medieval warfare better and believe me, really better than most actual military historians really do but again the problem behind wargaming is trying to simplify exactly where the simulation should expand the complexity uh, of the picture right um, so whenever I use the term wargamistic war most of the time it's because I'm trying to make sense myself when, when I explain about certain combat techniques in military history videos 
that you cannot essentially think that one weapon or one armor etc was making the entire thing because most people really stop to that because the easiest thing of all is materialism right if you think that warfare is essentially about technology which is what a shockingly large or even prevalent amount of actually adult people and this is an incredibly disturbing actually believe um well you can easily start talking about guns armor whatever and making all that kind of nonsensical abstract anti-scientific um and also immoral as we explain now considerations um and this is the worst thing really ignoring the fact that all this ha- say the the all the stuff you discuss about happened historically for us to see how it actually was, right? Even with all its limits that we just exemplified, in front of which everybody should say, look, we just don't know, right? Just learn to say this, right? Uh, it is true that there is no such thing like the impossibility of breaking a record or in the sense of widening your knowledge about a certain topic, uh, and some people say, well, even our experimental archaeology, all this stuff helps to do so. That's also another issue I have, because I actually don't believe um, that this is the case, if not for very marginal aspects that do not have to do with what war deals with primarily, that is moral forces that dominate the entire, um, as a spirit, the entire material side of the story right because uh shields and sword do not beat each other for no reason again this is what the, the the sort of idiocy that the you know the deadliest warrior thing brought in right that these two guys once they, they meet and they uniquely see the disparity between one another are supposed just to keep killing each other uh in, in which is in which reality context right w- what is this right and saying you know things but because they're they're equally skilled what, what does it even mean Right. You know, do you think that historically or humanly this makes sense? Do you think that that's how wars are fought? Do you think that that's how people go at war for one another and kill each other and find a means to kill one another? Right. This is an incredibly childish and immature way of reason. And this, of course, does not just fuel stupidity in the form of determinism, but it also um, literally shows a, a complete degree of moral relativism. Because it means that what you concern yourself with is an abstraction from the practice of reality that you would never find, even historically speaking. Because it's, of course, never a, a one-to-one per- war is never a one-to-one person, um, and people ha- still have problems to, co- to to conceive the fact that you must work uh, collectively with a discipline to do things, and tactics are very often much more about the, the bigger picture than than a smaller one. And in really um, studying, uh, reconstructing a battle from the actual sources is one of the most humbling experiences you can you can uh, you know uh, go through, especially when you repeat it as you're supposed to do in a diachronic and comparative way throughout military history. When you will realize that, of course, at the time they understood perfectly well why battles were lost and won. And none of this technologism or a weapon or another had to do with that. They literally didn't give a damn about that, right? They didn't care. They didn't write about that because it was not not because it was written by a priest, uh, which is also not often the case. But also, it, it's literally not important, right? And uh, banally quantities are are are, even, are usually more important, and warfare is usually something. Um, as relevant as it is that tends towards symmetry even though it's always a symmetry so these are all questions that if you are not habituated to think like um, on a regular basis you will not be helped by wargaming more than much because you would be pro if you are at least one a very legalistic wargamer right one that thinks that the only thing that matters is creating the game that that fixes those rules because those rules must be a sort of, you know, based on factors that you uh, found out as the golden section, right? And um, you do not even represent realistically how certain moral, say, dynamics are represented on on the battlefield, but not just by giving, I don't know, a certain pointage of morale to to a certain guy. You cannot, you cannot actually. Um, pretend that this is a serious thing in the first place 
nor uh, I made videos, by the way, about Total Wars that I, I played for for a long time, and and I appreciate, of course, the fact that you can have this uh, simulations, let's say, but uh, th these are useful to to show certain things, and you can have again a video game as you can have a board game, and and there there is a problem because, of course, uh, they they can't represent equally, right? Even if they were meant to represent the same thing, right? They can't represent through the mean that it's literally a board or literally a video game. Um, you know, the depth of, of of something so complex that very often, also from a historical point of view, you cannot determine the causes of at the end of, of a battle, right? You cannot quite see, saying, you know, this is the factor for which this battle surely went that way. We do not have, it from a military historical point of view, the capacity of calculating that. Um, we basically just see the tip of the iceberg, and the iceberg being, of course, um, still about lots of other factors that are submerged, and you can see maybe uh, still other tips here and there, but that are not to be given to us. Right, because even if you see a battle nowadays, it's, we don't have a say a better say. It's not a matter of better documentation. How do you quantify moral forces? Moral forces cannot be quantified, and people are weak, are cowardly, are are are, are stupid, and they must believe in order to cover up this condition that um, reality again is about those few things. Just seeing the what. Is 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 what what can be seen, right? And ignoring or not making the effort to, to appreciate that there is um, a matter of value in in those that, especially moral forces, in what you cannot see, in what interacts with one another, you are not able to see. You're not able to reconstruct, document. They will always tend to ignore moral forces, but also most operational issues. Because what is this game going to be? A war game going to be about strategy, tactics? How do you connect the two things? Right? There are very complex systems in war gaming, and try to to get this uh, properly. But they are always a um, a simplification of reality. This is not to say that, as you know, these games were not used by the same military, or that there weren't even some important um, military. Uh, strategies that were sorted out through wargaming, but the myth is uh, presuming that that knowledge came f and that th the size of edge came from the game in itself, right? The only way to know military history and uh, and to, to know how to make war is um, is to study, campaign, and battle one after the other for your entire life, using all the sources available, so making a massive amount of research that an average person doesn't even know how, where to start from, with all the actual evidence available, which should not even may be enough, I, as it as it's the case too often, um, and and then hoping that they have understood anything of that. Naturally, the best way to know how to wage war is to fight a war, right? Uh, this is what the same. The same from Clausewitz says, you know, when, when a war is fought, if you're not a war yourself, you should go out there and essentially document war as much as you can, which is military history, right? It's effectively military history. It's, you see, there is no boundary there between what a person tries to make sense of and the historian's activity in this case. And then that, uh, say, experience deriving from this is the fighting a war is best. We're talking about positions of command. Let's, let's, of course, first of all, debunk the idea that soldiers understand the wars they're fighting. They don't. right? They don't have a, a, a strategic culture or education. They, I, If you re listen to some veterans' interviews, mo most of them li literally do not even suspect that such a thing exists. For them, it's just the war. Like for most people, it's just things happen for some strange reason that they must find a univocal or simplistic explanation to, and just to feel content for their own moral shortcoming. Um, if you study war scientifically, you can't do that, and war games lack the joints to make this thing um, realistic. Lack the um, the level of first of all, probably the the moral involvement in the same. 
right? What if, you know, you lose in one of these war games and your house, your literal home explodes um, as part of the rule? Or, you know, you lose this, I don't know, this chess. Chess has nothing to do with strategy, by the way. It's just a deterministic um, game for people with a lot of memory. It has nothing to do with a strategic education. It's just to sharpen the mind in some ways, but absolutely not to to reason in a, let's say, in a, in a way that actually ha has to do with any military capacity. What if you lose a chess and I actually slaughter your dog? It's not that... I did do that, but if I actually do, you come back home and you, you find your 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 dog, in, in, you know, completely massacred. That wouldn't even be a minimal part of what moral pressure is um, during a war, right? It's not continuous. It doesn't. Th these games normally do not do not properly provide with the the way because you see, if we did so, we would know how to predict war. And this is not possible. As we, it's not possible to predict the world. It's n our uh, strategic analysis, our market analysis, do not go very far to be reliable. We go essentially four months to four months at best, and still that's a, a, a time span in which things normally go, in a, in, of course, in a, in a different way from the one we expected. Maybe not at large, but still with issues that we would have not even thought uh, that would have arisen. Uh, in the first place, and this is a bit the problem of our existence, the problem of history, right? So, um, to me, like that, there is also a hierarchical factor. That is, um, does it even matter, like for example, in, in in a medieval battle, to assess what kind of equipment a certain type of infantry had or not, right? L let's leave aside the fact that you could. E even guess, but is it in terms of the calculation, but because of the the general condition of what we would, would know about that world, that politics, that, that society, but do you, do you think that we could reconstruct a medieval battle simply because, I don't know, we know that some guys had a different equipment, different armament from one another when they were actually performing the same function, say, of, of, as an arm, right? Um, this is yet another thing that I discovered adults have problems with right the 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 idea that you know they can't normally get that there is again a normally in warfare level of symmetry that is pre makes things look pr pretty flat and similar. I mean there are actual adults that believe that uh, the English won the greatest battles of the Hundred Years War because of the longbow. I mean, they actually believe it. And in order to explain to them that it's not the case and that the English armies of the Hundred Years' War won the war because they were good armies in the first place, um, and the difference that stands between heavy infantry or light infantry, for example, why were, for example, the English fighting as, as infantry and not as cavalry sometimes, that, that's something so basic and elementary um, for somebody who's strategically educated that when you meet with somebody that just... It's not even able to provide the actual answer for that, and that still, however, pretends to be an expert or a passion or making this kind of reconstructions about that very thing that maybe he has spent an entire life with about. That that's the ridiculous thing. Well, you cannot take these people seriously. You cannot take this activity seriously. You cannot think that there is, and this depends on a single person. It's not on war gaming. Again, war gaming is a way of simulation that is intelligent and must be respected. But most people, unfortunately, are not intelligent and are not to be respected because they call it on themselves, right? And this is true for all of us because we all make mistakes. And the important is to reduce them, right? So if, again, I pretend to, re re say, to simulate a, a, a historical event, that we know went in a certain way, and that we're aware of the, the broader complexity of, right? Which has nothing to do with saying we don't know what happened, because that's also an, a mistake that is often done, right? That um, these people do not know what actually happened in these battles until an actual military historian comes and says, well, look, this happened because they reconstructed it in this way. There are some battles that you literally must solve as a problem. I, 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 it happens to me to, again, I stress mostly the tactical side because that's what I do. Uh, best and um, and I can tell you, yeah, that there is a lot of say uh, hype, a lot of 
uh, ap- it's ultimately an emotional thing. It, it reveals, in fact, a mental weakness as such uh, about these great battles, the, you know, the great battles that changed history, all this kind of stuff. And then you, you actually listen to what people who are into this stuff think. And, and you realize that they have never opened a history book. They never studied an actual source. They're not able to read it. I, I know people that... Uh, this was mostly in the reenacting community. I will make, I hope, this autumn a mega video to explain my uh, incredibly uh, unfortunate experience with, with say, reenactment and historical martial arts and all these things, because that, that's that's terrifying. You cannot avoid, you see, you, you could even leave the benefit of, of the doubt of saying, yeah, well, but it's not all bad. But when you actually meet the people and you realize that they are, they, they are truly categorized, against any odd, even mathematically, through the same idiocy, right, actually believed on no basis, um, that's where you start losing any respect, faith, and interest in these activities, right? One thing is attracting, again, kids. Um, one thing is, of course, making money, which is also another driving factor, especially the latter's activities. Um, another thing is being serious, consistent, Right, I, it takes me, uh, you know, three months of continuous work to write correctly about a small battle. Right, an article that actually says everything in a precise way, and that's normally how, in fact, are how long uh, articles really take to be written and to be evaluated, and the the complexity, the nuances, the problems, the criticisms, the things they had not realized until you made that work. That is extremely demanding um surely make you aware per se by the at that point you can't do can't unnotice that right and so when when you realize what what it's like for for the average right and you understand the uh, you know the, the the directions that certain minds take without making the step that is needed you can't avoid to realize there, there is a failure there and, and things are misrepresented things are not really the ones that they could be when i modified video games myself the, the most important thing i did was not in fact what, what you see even in the modern community is about graphics um skins texture uh, textures uh exotic type of units i didn't care i i wanted in, in that from that point of view actually and especially knowing the ancient and medieval world to to simplify much of that because there was a much greater similarity um, than than we think, and I'm not saying that. Uh, say, but th- there is too great emphasis in, in in the modern community about those things. And what I really cared about modding that I also brought to a discrete level was the the more important things. Let's say that, for example, the the longer term, ma- ma- making the thing more, say, making, say, um, going towards the actual historical outcome but still working it from the the small factors in other words trying to uh, it's a bit like an artificial intelligence i mean working as the uh, at the root and seeing how changing or introducing a factor can affect the outcome and testing and retesting and retesting wargaming is about this too but i think it usually uh, escapes the the more um, important aspect of warfare that is command right the only um, games that I played let's say can't say were being war games actually were of a very specific nature first of all I did read something myself that von Clausewitz made some of these games and, and some of them were very beautiful because um, they were intelligent games right they weren't games that uh, first of all, made you reason about what was the primary objective, right? You know, what is the primary objective? Well, this is the impression I got from wargaming, that most wargaming in, in pop, today's pop culture that is reflective of our uh, general condition historically is about looking at the small details, right, and fixating on that. So even if the bigger picture is not, this triumphant, but say if you got the, the minimal things right, you didn't challenge anybody's mind more than much, and you just stayed to the game and you played the game. Right? If it's a game, if it is for the game, 
Have fun how you like, I, I, don't, I don't mind. However, when we get to serious wargaming, the one that is also used by the military, with some important, uh, of course, result as well in a teaching capacity, because that's, at the end of the day, what the purpose of them all is a sort of simulation of what you could see. Even I mean, the military also uses video game simulators. I mean, it's, 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 it's obvious. But even there, uh, the more you get into the detail, can can be the small tactical one, right? Uh, how to drive a tank, right? Engaging an enemy that, that can obviously and must be very useful if you if you are a, a tanker and that's your your job. But if you're going to win the war, of course, the most important thing is having a strategic education, military culture, um, understanding what the art of war gets down to, how how it is learned, and especially posing those questions that are the most important, the one. Uh, that the commander-in-chief should pose himself, first of all, in a political sense, uh, which, at least as far as reality is concerned, but in these games that take it out, because they um, they present you normally just with the strategic, that is properly just, just the military side of the story, they tell you, what is the objective here? Like, a country is invading you, for example. What do you do? Well, von Clausewitz did write about this stuff. Um, and the... The answers of the, it's interesting because there, there was, uh, say, an epistolary correspondence of back and forth, of, um, and it, it's beautiful. And I will make videos about this. How he corrects him, first of all, in about the most important decisions. Right, it's not about trying to work many little pieces um, uh, in detail from from the top condition of command thinking that that's enough right to move this little thing here to move this little thing there but to to actually move the entire thing in the way that strategically makes more sense um and that has mostly um a counter um intuitive logic right for example and this is where most people get it to wrong and to the degree of thinking that that culturalism for example, is the best way to think war. That is to say, war is made just by, the, by a bunch of violent people that are stupid and emotional. Um, and so you're a barbarian if you make war, whoever you are. Um, and, and so uh, there can be a future without war, right? Um, war, because you, war is an instinctive thing. Um, I don't know really how war can even be imagined as an instinctive thing. I mean, it goes against the, the primary instinct um, of survival. If anything, war is, in all the fields, uh, it, it can be wars that, of course, are disastrous and stupid and badly fought and whatever, and that's still part of the limit. But war, par excellence, is the thing that is, is ident was identified historically by anyone by displaying the greatest amount or requiring the greatest amount of reason of all, and that in the way it is normally thought, it is really done so, because it, it first of all meets, uh, say, uh, that uh, middle ground between politics and, and warfare, given that uh, war is, of course, uh, just a continuation of politics with other means, um, and it, it must accept the risk, as we were saying at the beginning of the video regarding the, the second, properly the military, um, person of, of the Trinity. Um, and in war, as von Clausewitz explains, the ultimate goal is, of course, the attack, per se. Any defense is aimed at a counter-attack. Um, because attack is the weakest form of war, because it definitely is more difficult, it requires proportionally more resources, but also the one with the positive aim, which is the reason why, of course, you can fight an entire world defensively. But the ultimate move, uh, unless, you know, at that point, politics retakes control on, on the matter, and so that is the settled at a table and not on the battlefield, is retaking, right? is taking, arriving to the point at which the enemy is going either to withdraw, to be annihilated, um, if insists in, at that point, having exhausted his offensive and, you know, remaining uh, in, on the defensive in turn. Um, so, 
these basic concepts very often I haven't found um, very well articulated. Even you know, if you think about the war in Ukraine and all the 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 noise, right, from uh, say anybody who wasn't much of a military analyst in the first place, uh, and independently from the side. Um, to the point that you have fanboys of both sides that say things that are basically gets down to whatever happens uh, negatively uh, to 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 your side, uh, you don't see it or you put many excuses. Whatever happens negatively to the opposite side, uh, they must be destroyed. That they're, they're they've lost the war. The, the whatever. Um, it doesn't work like this. Right, the people who study war, even the not even the military historians, but the military analysts that work every day for telling you what actually happens on the battlefield, are there for a reason. Are there for making your mind working, um, and uh, that sense of engagement in the first place in 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 simulation is greatly lost. I mean, the, the concept of the moral forces and the way these apply to eventually how things materialize on the battlefield is unknown, largely unknown to most people. And definitely when you are on playing a board game um, or whatever battle you think, you, by the way, you can change the odds. That, as we will see now, is the uh, is the greatest problem uh, philosophically uh, with, with war gaming, with, with actual history of how it happened. Um, you you're not minimally scratched by that right it is an actual game and the main problem there is whenever one wants to replay i don't know the battle of zama or the battle of waterloo and um is is the fact that these battles um not just have been overwhelmingly studied and we know why things went more or less the way they did um and this one's a specific, I mean, there is no great mystery. Zama and Waterloo are pretty clear battles, right? There are much more complicated ones uh, that still have to be reconstructed properly. Um, and it, it's, it's in fact uh, ironic how, um, you know, fanboys, because also, as we'll see now, I, the impression I've gotten is that Wargaming is about that kind of uh, mindset always pick this great names and this great commanders and the thing because they it's as if those who played wanted to be that it's as if they 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 thought that the actual historical reality at the time could be say re redone remade resimulated for a better outcome on the basis of by the way um uh fact factors that you pretend at that point uh, that either we don't know to some degree of had hadn't existed at the time or um, that you could change without even knowing that they historically existed I explain myself better what ifs are in my opinion a waste of time because say unless there is an immediate of course, uh, what if I think are good in a broader sense? Like, what if the the Anglo-Saxons had won the Battle of Hastings, right? I don't even start thinking, you know, what 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 would the 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 uh, the Anglo-Saxons do at Hastings to actually win? There is a general mechanism, of course, of the Battle of Hastings that you could say. Um, of course, they could have behaved differently, but the problem is that we lack any quantitative evidence of how margin there was for doing any of this stuff, or whether what, we don't even know what the RA was technically like. We don't know with precision most of the things that would be needed to, to make that um, that decision. So what, what's even the point of asking for that, right? But there is a, a more punching point, right? Aside, again, this fact of what ifs saying okay well if the anglo-saxon won probably britain would have remained in a sort of a uh, more scandinavian kind of re dimension the old the, the history could change wow yes it's mind-blowing but then can you predict what would have happened in 50 years that that that's actually dumb but nobody would have known nobody does that right nobody can know that in the first place uh, it's impossible it's pure fantasy you can exercise it to show that you have um, a historical knowledge, but you can't quite say, well, I nailed it, because, you know, there is the way to sort that out. But again, the, the single most punching thing 
about that is these battles actually happened. I mean, military history is studied, and this is made clear extremely by von Clausewitz that explains how to study military history, exactly because what we are documenting happened in reality. So the, the single m most important thing as a consequence about this is the actual outcome. I mean, what's the point of presenting a reality that we already know how it went and say, well, well we could change that. Well, what for? Right? It's a uh, abolition that goes aside from reality itself uh, and that actually denies what actually happened. Of course, you can say, well, if this guy had not given battle that day, well, of course, things could have changed. We could easily say that, but in a very short term, and um, to which ultimate uh, point, if you're still forcing the actual causes for which that general actually chose that in the first place, right? And but this is not a deterministic point at all, because that's what we must learn. The moment of the decision, the moment of, of action, the responsibility of command. If a great general decided to fight that battle that day and to lose or to win, our duty as historians is to explain why he did that. Right? It, it, it's a ridiculous and just, again, purely abstract and uh, just irre historically irrelevant point to say, well, what if he had done something else? Right? Um, of course, you can think of how to have won a war. Right, whether it was possible to do so when, for example, a mistake is evident. But still, at that point, to to Vuz use that that would go practically. When when, because this is not just uh, an arbitrary judgment. When you have so much military history that you do not know and you still have to sort out. I mean, my first problem as a military historian is to sort out as much military history as I can, because that's the only way I can understand anything. And every time I, I do it, I, I realize how complex and difficult and vast and, and of, based and, of course, um, impossible to cover entirely really is. But the more you do it, and still the more you acquire that, that capacity, um, and you are able to read other events in a, in a, in a very, uh, better way, right? Because exactly at that point, you will realize much better what could be the many other variables that you have not seen before, right? This is very easy when you start to see because, say, you reconstruct a battle and just a set of things happen in that battle. So until you study another battle, you will not think that, for example, things could go much more differently than another. You will try to think that more or less... You will inspire yourself to this battle. It is all you know and remain fixed there, right? The more you know other battles, the more you realize that also in that battle there were so many other things that you hadn't thought of that could have happened and that didn't happen, but that if they didn't, it's also because probably something was in a certain way that you, they can contribute to reconstruct how the thing really was, right? So playing over and over and over and over and over again on a board game, the battle of Zama, um, I don't think, in the light of, of, say, of ancient sources, to be a particularly intelligent thing. What do you think you can derive from that? Right, everything is well explained. Right, um, uh, everything is coherent. It's military logical. But you can even find sources that say things that are not true. But at that point, you will somehow easily criticize them because it, that's not the most important thing. There is no gotcha moment in which you say, "Ah, look." Because of this single thing I found, uh, I sorted, I, I, I resolved the entire, the, the entire problem. No. It's always about trying to make various factors of which we are um, the uh, say, uh, chronically deprived of information to, say, to work with one another and see what is the most military logical and probable solution for that reconstruction. And I can tell you that still most military history is really not studied the way it should. Um, this is, and again, as we were saying before, the, mo the greatest problems arrive to 
um, to to the greatest pictures, right? Uh, people, for example, do not understand World War II not because uh, they don't know what uh, an MG42 or, or or a bar really is. Um, it is because they lack the most complete and basic historical notions about 20th century Europe, its past, whatever, and they can't make sense of what happened because they literally just can at best guess without being informed. And so the single most incredible distortions, prejudices, um, myths that are also, by the way, part today of a, of a historical um, awareness. I mean, what happened after World War II politically um, from, from, from all sides, uh, of course, contributed heavily to the way World War II was seen. And there are certain myths that still exist because at the time it was even politically right to actually use a certain, for example, interpretation of World War II to make certain other things work. Um, this is obvious. Right, depending on I don't know presidential elections or you know the the demographics of a certain country, like these were all things that we should know today because they're being studied, but that people still believe in because it, it's just a convenient thing to do. And more than factionalism, more than partisanry, it has to do with the simplicity that um, flatters uh, the mental shortcoming of the individuals that so can't feel themselves as if they were normal and instead they're not. Right, um, and you would think that maybe this is a bit far-fetched, like starting from wargameism, but wargameism is very interesting in this sense because it does reveal such uh, such pictures. So my, my advice, by the way, is is always the same: be extremely wary of any supposed military historical expert, whoever he is. Um, but especially of those who fundamentally focus just on one and only thing. Right. Um, this is also true for certain type of reenactment, etc. I mean, if one guy is fixated exclusively with, just for the sake of example, I don't know, the Thirty Years' War that I love personally, so I'm not biased against or any other topic. If their entire life is building, you know, uh, making weapons like the one of the Thirty Years' War, practicing with them. Uh, creating uniforms that are exactly like the ones of the Thirty Years' War, um, reading about this battle that they reenact in that place, that, about the Thirty Years' War, but fundamentally stopping your entire world to pretend that you are, I don't know, a guy um, uh, in, 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 a, in a 17th century army that has to reproduce only that, and fundamentally stopping your all the rest of any possible knowledge about any other topic, that may even have happened in contemporary to the Thirty Years' War, etc., and pretending especially that, I don't know, it's a great deal to know, beside just what you already do. Just know that that person literally doesn't know anything about military history, doesn't understand even what it's doing, or what the, the, the entire thing was. Uh, let's leave aside, of course, the most common forms of identitarism, the fact that um, these initiatives are mostly happening because uh, there are people who basically are complaining against uh, the fact that they, they failed um, socially, culturally, and so they, they want to pretend that the past times were better than the ones we're living in and, and being so true about because they think that that's how true men really live. Like, and then, again, they don't even understand warfare, which men at the time uh, understood much better. Um, but together with a traditional value that these people... Do not have the, the mere that even the the, the close the closest thing to a suspect of, of a suspicion of what it could e could actually be at the time. Well, just know that this this thing is is like a a poison, right? It it spreads and it it's incredibly easy. It's in, it's incredibly seductive, um, because again, it gives the opportunity to, also to the the people who literally do not know anything to pretend that they do. Right, and this is a terrible thing, and it, because it harms the rest of the people, because once this guy has said it's dumb, technologistic, positivistic, deterministic, relativistic um, uh, nonsense uh, at a conference in which you know he acts as if he was this great expert about 
um, you know, the, the death, the thing of the 30 years of war that he's reenacting and that, you know, this thing is not really said in academies. You can't quite say it. You, you know that uh, all those who have listened to it and that largely haven't the palest idea of what the, the topic is really about will repeat that BS. And this goes on and on and on and on. It's us it's useless, believe me. I At least my experience is, is too much. Um, like, the numbers cannot be a coincidence, right? I will make that video about having met with these people in, in consistent numbers, and it, it's incredibly easy to frame them in, in a psychological category um, because they they literally say the same things, and it's terrifying. Um, the same wrong things that we know, by the way, already and from a quite a long time why they're wrong and why psychologically also people need to make that mistake and what is that they don't know. This is amazing because it's a sort of psychological <laughs> psychology class, right? And uh, you literally learn how people think. I would think that history is actually about this. I, it's much easier for me to understand people uh, the more I study history. It's incredibly easy, for example, whatever historical taste they have, to understand what political opinion they have. Just immediate, but not even just after having talked for, uh, for, for half an hour, it just it can be in the first 30 seconds. Just the way they express themselves. It's incredibly easy, and it's incredibly funny if it wasn't for what you actually find out about them. Um, and I say these people as, in general, can be anyone, right? This, these are not exceptions, let's say, but they tend to um, insistate to to feel incredibly, uh, you know, entitled and, uh, of course, in an incredibly uh, undeserving way by any s educational standard, uh, just because it's their thing. It's a form of narcissism, fundamentally. I, I don't, you know, I, I claim that, of course, I know things that other people literally don't know because I have studied the entire historiographical production on the topic and I know that this thing that I found out is not as was not said before but I don't say this is my thing unless somebody doesn't quote me when, when they're uh, revealing this thing or they try to steal my, my work that's another thing but history is beautiful again because it's not something you can grab Right from take away from somebody else, it, it's out there for everybody to know, and it, and it's reality itself, and it doesn't change. It doesn't matter how hard you try, um, and the best way you can, the best thing you can do is to actually know that, um, and not pretending to 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 essentially f simplify it, cheapen, and hopefully maintain in in that in those constraints just because you're not capable of understanding the broader thing, and that's what we're gaming basically does right so the only war gaming that i actually like is truly the kriegspiel at least not the one that became i mean i'm talking about it philosophically not the one that actually do today i mean maybe it's it's a funny thing i don't know i never tried uh, i know that they, they still are very um you know traditionalistic about it. The interesting thing is that you find factionalism currents within these movements. They all hate each other for some reason and behind the, the facade of, ah, yes, we are so proud about this thing. And and that attitude, especially, that thing, ah, I, I'm so expert about Warfare because I play this game and have this hidden knowledge of the world that would save, that would win any war, or that would make so much difference because I play this game. Like, th this, this way of thinking by default, is exactly the one that makes wars ending up in complete disaster, right? And and again, I, I, I will make some content about uh, von Clausewitz's letters and other historical work because he dealt with this by doing what, according to you? Studying military history. Von Clausewitz, that he's overlooked in this, but he was an excellent military historian. He knew a dramatic lot. All those imbeciles, Keegan, um, you know, if we're not talking about the charlatan of, of little art, the, the thief and charlatan of, of little art, that I still find people coming on my channel and saying, have you ever read, read little art? It, it, immediately, from that statement, red flag, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about, doesn't know what the guy was, what he did. It's that all the type of superficial knowledge that everybody that needs the field to use certain names without understanding the mechanism, things to throw around to, to show this, that they're so great at it. Um,
But von Clausewitz, just because I'm a medievalist and I'm told that von Clausewitz is only talking about contemporary warfare in the modern state and whatever, BS, von Clausewitz had an incredible intelligence in the old the various wars of you know of, of i don't know the 10th century between this lord or another the, and, and, and with a, this castle at, i don't know three kilometers one from the other this endless mess um not understanding that means not understanding Clausewitzian theory at all and i think that keegan are people who told at places like sandhurst etc not only they have never studied but they not even read von Clausewitz, let alone a board gamer, right? And it's, again, useless to, uh, to pretend otherwise. I I'm talking in general. I'm sure that there is plenty of board gamers that have studied the von Krieg in the original language and read and commented the entire von Krieg. Um, but you would forgive me if I think that the next one uh, that I'll meet will have not. Right, so uh, that is just uh, experience, I, I would say. So, um, word gameism here is criticized um, primarily for the simplification, for the banalization, for this need to reduce everything to factors, rules um, that eventually do not apply in reality. Because again, there is no way primarily to measure moral forces and to see even more to, to predict how they will interact uh, on on the battlefield right and also beware because they did meet people of this kind that that think that the smallest thing change everything they do this is not to say that they don't but there are people who fundamentally do not know what strategy is and think that i don't know what truly really matters in wars is i don't know how fast a messenger travels now there are to, to bring that order, right? There are instances, of course, in warfare, plenty of in which, you know, if, if a messenger made it in time or whatever, big deal, things could change. But the only reason why we remember that is because of all the infinite, you know, uh, amount of messengers that ever existed, that was the case, which is definitely not a frequent one in which that thing, especially the largest engagements, uh, ever depended on that. And so, again, looking at the, the not even the tip of the iceberg, but the, the penguin that stands over it and saying, that's what matters. I love penguins, by the way, but that's another problem. Um, uh, and, the, um, and, and ignoring the entire, like, what was moving that thing, as if armies were just a bunch of idiots that went into traps without knowing, or that the others, you know, were just easily destroying them um, because it's notoriously so easy to make other people making mistakes or simply making themselves um, being butchered down um, for for no reason. That that's not that's also the the, the the determinism many people use right in front of great battles, great disasters, also etc. They say, uh, "Oh my God, that that guy who lost was so stupid, and the guy who won was so great." N not always, right? Um, that's you can also do everything right and being defeated in the end right it's, it's not uh, that that's not really how war works uh, that there is a, a very co a deep conceptual problem in not realizing how concretely wars are won or lost right understanding what strategy is concretely how it interlocks with tactics it's not so immediate right uh, lots of people believe that logistics has to do with the art of war it doesn't as a matter of fact I mean, um, logistics is something that can, you know, can, even a civilian can do, and not having the palest idea of how to join it to, to, to an army. What matters strategically in, about logistics is where, for example, you have to move your army in order to be better supplied, not what kind of cart you use to, to bring the food or how that is organized. Of course, a general will have to take care of that, but it, it's not part of the strategic decision, because that's and it's very important conceptually to understand a merely mil military concept, right? Uh, a civilian can make a perfect trench, even assuming he knows what's the best one to use in a given context. But how, where that trench has to be located, that's not uh, his to, to, to know, right? That must be decided, and it, 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 it serves a strategical purpose that the architect, the engineer, doesn't doesn't have, doesn't normally have, right? Unless, of course, there is military engineering, etc. But the, 
it, the, 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 the conceptual distinction um, is fundamental because people f fundamentally mix it uh, all the time at different levels do not make any sense. Um, and this gets to even simple things like tactics, for example. I I made last autumn a video criticism of um, who was Shadiversity about tactics of the Middle Ages, something that lasted like 15 minutes. And you can still make a, a decent video in 15 minutes to explain the most elementary thing about medieval tactics. It was all it, That was not the problem, the length. The problem is that it was all rigged, right? Um, they thinking of um, missile, uh, light infantry, let's say, as, as, as an same, say, not, if not an equivalent, but something at the same level of, of, of heavy infantry. And even they're not, even explaining people what's the difference and why they're called like this, and using them just as a card that you can use instead of the other. Right? Flattening the entire thing, that's the kind of gross mistakes and... Um, um, and definitely inadequ inadequacy, right? You cannot go out there in front of so many people and boasting a knowledge that you do not have, right? If I know something, I explain it to you. And there are many things I touch on this this video, for example, that I explained for hours in hours. Um, but except people do not watch that, they want to see pictures, right? That that's the problem. But that's that's unfortunately what you know when you start this thing, right? Because the it, it comes immediate um, to immediately to your attention as long as you find out um, certain things. Um, so the things that are just easy for, to see for causal causal eye, causal eye. I, I was thinking about causal. Um, about the the question um yeah i mean it's thinking i don't know um it, there is a lot lots of uh fanboyism iconologism it gets to figurinism at some point there is this other aspect i as i was saying at the beginning i like toy soldiers very much and i like uniform and this stuff and they interest me but i know there are also some of the least important things per se um in uh, in war um, there are people who fixate literally on, say, making the collection of the type of units that they can use on the board game, that they can paint on their own, um, and customize uh, to to have all the set of ah, oh, I have my I don't know, I have my uh, my Roman sentry, or my I don't know, my my Anglo-Saxon feared unit, um, whatever it is, um, and. And the point is, um, yeah, okay, but it, it, it's nice. Uh, I like that uh, visually, aesthetically as well. But then you realize that these people actually play the game, uh, and that game is incredibly flat. In, in It's not fine. At that point, just play a video game. I think it's, in a sense, more intelligent. Even a Total War game can give you um, say more sensible insight. Not so easily telling you the truth, but in, in some core concept um, about things that you will never see in this this kind of kind of thing. Surely there will be an improvement in the future with AI, all this stuff. But I remember this: you can never replicate something like uh, a war, because if we did, the world would be completely changed. No, that's not going to happen. We're not going to have a machine that will have a comprehensive understanding of reality beyond what humans do. Because in order to program it, you need uh, a, a human mind that makes the machine do that materially, deterministically. Well, that's impossible by definition. It's not a matter of how much you're going to regulate this or how much you're going to discover, but how much results. It surely will be gotten. But we will never get to the point of predicting the future. It's impossible. right? The best thing you can do is acting, learning, and keeping on acting and becoming better at it. This is the entire point of the Clausewitzian thing. And no, uh, you cannot do it if you do not feel, if you do not have a sense of moral forces. 
artificial intelligence is not intelligence. It can it cannot do it by definition, right? So let's also get rid of that uh, misconception, because it, it it's a great mistake to arrive to the point in which this mistake again that is made by by the common person will be applied to a general fate into matter. This is the same Marxist ideology. I mean, placing the means of production above human beings. It's the death of mankind uh, due to their own stupidity. And this is incredibly seducing, again, because the idea of somebody else doing for you, rejecting any personal responsibility and improvement is, of course, the dream of billions of people in the world by now. And those are the problems. And nobody can afford the, a world made like this. Th then going on with the question, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on war gaming more broadly and conceptually, uh, its origins and beyond, especially since you deal largely with Clausewitz in theory. Clausewitz theory and the genesis of modern war games seem to have grown up in the milieu of that historical figure in early 19th century Prussia. Yes, and in that regard, these games weren't, as I said, at least von Clausewitz ones were mostly examples of situations you could find yourself in and they got down to the moment of action of decision. I made a series last autumn that is about uh, the war of the third coalition um, and there were some say points um, during the, say, the various decisions of Napoleon and the allies where I stopped and I said look at the picture Right, normally this is not something that I normally do for every military uh, analysis that, that I make in my videos, because I want to make you understand what matters in, in case you, you you're not there already yourself. And I focus in that on the moment of the decision, because again, this is not about regulating which kind of hit points uh, a Roman gladius has to 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 try to change uh, the Battle of Zama. It's completely irrelevant. Especially considering that you already are in a reality that has been developed like that, so you, there's not much you could do to change that in the first place. Again, technologism, positivism, determinism, ma materialism, relativism, etc. All garbage. Um, but, again, the decision that was made from the top that would eventually make the rest work for what was already designed right what was important at Austerlitz among the various things but Napoleon's plan indeed and Napoleon could afford that plan because he could rely on a military instrument that was able to carry out that plan successfully. Of course, something would go wrong and nobody could exactly know what would have happened during the battle because there were still reserves that the uh, Austrians and the, and the Russians had to, to pour in and, and everything was... we often forget this, that it, it, was, the, uh, it, it was decided in, in the last phases of the battle. There is no such thing like, I played this card, how I found the way to, to, to defeat my enemy and he hasn't found out I will surely win. Not no commander in history ever reasoned like this. No commander can uh, say no army will, will just put itself in the conditions of being annihilated um, without a fight that can seriously compromise also the enemy plan. It's not a thing. Even in the most disastrous battles, wars, campaigns, that's not what actually happened. This is what military history shouts to us continuously, macroscopically, um, out loud, forever, and nobody wants to accept, because again, it challenges the fact that people have to make an effort in order to succeed in things. That's the mental disease that we're dealing with here, right? So the moment of the decision, how do you orchestrate your plan? There are some basic principles in the art of war, and they must be understood as such. I think I made a video on it, if not, I will make one then. Um, so, 
von Clausewitz, I think, well exemplified that in his explanation. I mean, he was a genius, let's be honest. Um, in his field, he was, uh, he knew how everything worked. He was a general uh, with, uh, let's say, an enormous experience. He uh, he was a theorist of enormous experience. The theory here is not doesn't mean abstraction. It means that it means essentially the the, the, the mental say the mindset right required in order to go at war knowing what you have to do with that. It's as if you had a manual in your head, except you don't have to search for the mm, chapter and the page when what you need is written, but just learning it through sheer practice. It's very difficult to find good generals that had just a theoretical um, insight, but there are. It's a bit, bit like you know finding a um, a coach that is good even at not uh, without having ever played the sport is coaching. Um, uh, it's rare, but there are people like this. Um, but it takes a lot of seriousness and a lot of studying uh, and a lot of intelligence. It's not. It's not for everyone. I mean, in theory, it would be for everyone, but most people decide that they're not going to do that. And so they cannot, at that point, however, pretend um, to to be accepted right, by those who do this thing seriously. Right? And I can assure you that I try to do it seriously. It's very difficult. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's dramatically easy to be better than the others at it because practically nobody studies it so it's just like having an historical literacy right? it, 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 above average it, it's very easy because the average is uh, a disaster um, but this doesn't mean that the world uh, or the things in general succeed um, uh, you know just because there is somebody who's better than the others there is an absolute value and everything, and if you run short of uh, what is necessary, like you're going to fail anyway. Um, and warfare should provide you with that sense of constant observation, of constant um, criticism, of constant analysis, not rolling a dice and saying, well, you know, that's what I have to follow at the end of the day. I can make this choice or this other, but at the end of the day, it, there is a, um, you know, there's just this narrow range of possibilities that can happen. doesn't matter how complex you try to make the war game, right? There are war games that, of course, are enormous and impracticable, impractical because they try to pursue this enormous complexity uh, in, uh, in everything that could happen. So it takes just a very long time to sort everything out to make a move. But in war, <laughs> there is no such luxury. So it's even ridiculous that um, we think that the human mind can, in that sense, simply um, sort out a system to replicate <laughs> the same complex of reality. That's the greatest mistake. That's the greatest foolishness that lays behind all this. this, this the, the only way to be an expert in this thing is just growing a lot of experience in practice. And if you don't, in, in theory, given that the theory is based, however, on practice, that is, military history as it was actually fought, but not as you're trying to sort out, again, by rolling dice. Sorting how warfare is actually fought means, again, that you, as I said, that you have to study from the complete sources, battle and campaign, from the beginning to the end of your life. That's the only way to be good at it. There is, there is no war game that can uh, do the, um, the, 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 the decisive amount of, uh, of work for that. There are war games that surely stimulate your intelligence, that are funny, that are, um, let's say, um, say, a complexion to, to this. But as von Clausewitz showed us, Right. Uh, as he wrote war games, as he studied military history, as he commanded armies on the battlefield, uh, and more, that, of course, the war game is just a test to your own general theory, right, that must be sound on a conceptual basis, and that you can find in the same form Krieger, 
which is exa essentially what I'm saying right now. I mean, it's the fact that you can, it's uh, against the Précis de l'Art de la Guerre by Yomini, uh, that is essentially a bit like what a war gamer would like history to be. And it's not that Yomini was dumb or whatever. He actually was a great man because at the end of his life, these two great parties, and after, by the way, von Clausewitz had died uh, much before, Yomini had a long life, um, von Clausewitz, as you know, died during uh, the in his 50s during the November uprising against Poland. Uh, and he and, and Yemeni recognized that von Clausewitz was right, that you can't reason by this, uh, say, concept of internal lines, how to try to, to uh, line up your troops with the right angle, the firepower, whatever, um, and try to solve everything as a sort of geometrical, deterministic, mathematical uh, problem. But war is not like this. And this is not that... That doesn't mean that this way of reasoning, say, in a material way, is not important. You, of course, have to appreciate the, the material side of the story in many ways. But realizing this mixes with the, with the moral one, that they are all deeply intertwined. You can have the best deployment, but if your troops are not good, and they're not motivated. It will be overrun. It will break. Um, so that's not something you can decide merely from a military point of view. There are things you can do better on the field, also on the base of certain tactical how to adopt. There is a doctrine, by the way. There right? was a way of, say, deploying forces in in a way, but it, it, it's, let's say, especially during Napoleonic warfare, you know that this becomes an incredibly aggregational concept. Right, that divisions were used in, in an attritional way as a mass one after the other. Um, there was maneuvering, there were important tactical insights and, say, uh, articulated plans, etc. But it's the general, it's the overview, it's the, the, the sense of what you want to strike. The concept of Schwerpunkt that we still have to see. I still haven't made a, a series about the Schwerpunkt, but that explains most actually what um the uh this uh this concept is about because uh, it's also in fact a very misunderstood concept M most people believe that the schwerpunkt is just the strong point of the enemy can even be the weakest as a matter of fact um or a, pl a, a, a position on the battlefield or attack people think that the schwerpunkt is a tactic right that we just go on google and 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 see what people think the stuff is that's much more educational in many ways um, than actually describing the mere concept because it tells you how much unreliable uh, most um, most common places are, right? Um, so that's where I would actually remain. Like the history of Kriegspiel and, and war games, I I think is is also, again, something that happens in parallel to a military history that is much more interesting to learn, and much more useful to the same end of understanding something about war, which is the reason why we, we make war games. I mean, let's be honest about it. If we wanted to simply have fun, we would do something else. We, there is a genuine and legitimate interest behind war gaming for war, for history, but... And, and say, it can be a... It can be a a path to it, but it's not going to be it, right? It's not going to be what what is satisfactory or not even necessary to to understand um, military history. Absolutely, and and more than military history, the art of war, because military history can even get down to reading stuff about warfare in general. The art of war is the diachronic in comparative understanding of, of uh, the, the transformation of strategy, tactics, armaments in history, that again, um, thinking of, let's say, your war game that is normally just one or a few, or at least something that if you're browsing so so easily and uh, you can easily switch uh, to, 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 to actual uh, scholarship, not games, right? It, it's going to be f concentrated on on uh, on one thing only, 
Again, somebody that plays the Battle of Zama, thinking to have, uh, for 200 times, thinking to have found the, the factors that they were actually used at the time, without even knowing what, whether that's the case, what the, the chain of command, what, how, how, um, how command worked itself, and, and how even some tactics that he pretended to replicate without knowing that, such as the aforementioned distance between a legionnaire and another, um, looks more like somebody with a mental disease than, and, and I say it because it goes nowhere, it's just like, I don't know, a dog that tries to, to, to chase uh, his own shadow, right? If he, he has fun once, it's fine. If he does it 10 times, it's fine. But the moment he starts to do it 100 times, that's actually a mental disorder. And I'm not kidding, right? These people w would indoctrinate themselves in, in the in the delusion that they are actually reproducing a real battle while they don't even suspect what that is is meant to be. And I'm not talking about the, the emotional shock or the violent... I'm talking about properly how they led armies at the time. Um, I was about to marry with um, a, uh, a reenactress who also practiced HEMA and actually believed that uh, you know, the most important thing was that they could do was being the better warriors individually to be the better archer and that she would trust anybody who was like that to go into a real war. Well, there is a reason why I didn't get married with her, if you wonder, because uh, it wasn't about this, but it was also indirectly in the sense that the way she would approach military history or whatever she thought it would, that was... Um, just was the same her mind was shaped like to understand any other thing in reality and and that is a, a serious problem i will not tell more because i you know i respect this person but let's say there was something pretty serious going on and uh and we must be quite i would say very wary of this because it Sometimes I suspect that there are real problems behind uh, such activities in the first place. Uh, that uh, I, I was told by many, actually, that there is something about your inner demons. Well, uh, you should take that very seriously, but not venting it in, in a field that you pretend that others do not nothing about just because you have never met somebody who understands something of it. It's not very wise. Um, I can understand the mistake, but it's not really how it should be. And the thing of, uh, of course, it's dealing with the 19th century, which seems to be a little outside your sphere of focus, with more medieval antique stuff. Well, it doesn't really change too much, right? I just made yesterday when it was uh, the video about uh, the American army in the early 19th century. I, I made other videos about uh, 18th, uh, 19th century warfare. Um, and it is true, it is beyond most my medieval, but it doesn't change the the essence of it. Um, it's, uh, it's something, again, you, you must develop. Uh, I will make, actually, more videos about 19th century warfare, because that that's I'm not just a medievalist. I, I, I think myself of myself as a military historian. Uh, and if I want to be, you know, arrogant and expert in, in in the theory of the art of war, but I um, say I am because I can dominate, of course, other fields that I don't normally venture in. All right, so yeah, I guess it's also a bit more of a theory topic than your usual historical one. Yes, as I said before, actually there are. Uh, if you search in the Easter Rain playlist, you will find plenty of them. And uh, there is um, there is a special attention to these topics that I I think should be definitely um, provided. Like it just. Um, It should should exist in in the first place. I don't I don't feel myself uh, like this enormous 
um, connoisseur of the topic uh, in the sense that at least for the standards that I think are required to handle the stuff seriously uh, I'm not sure who does handle them seriously because you can't be uh, who, who does right I honestly don't know aside from there are some analysts but they're often also concentrated in their own world I see um, a tendency for example even a it, let's also debunk the myth that it, it takes to be a military man to actually understand war because the, the, the contemporary military or most of the one at other times didn't necessarily um, uh, really understand war as such right the, the contemporary military is given essentially with some modules to to learn how to to uh, to perform, right, and developing hopefully some kind of uh, strategic culture accordingly. But of course, being uh, a good commander is something that comes only mostly through practice, and it's also difficult at some point to evaluate because everything is in war is, of course, not just much more messed up than it seems, but um, it's uh, also um, difficult as we were saying, to, to reconstruct historically, right? You don't immediately identify, um, like, the, among the, the enormous amount of data, what, what is that you immediately have to take in consideration? Or you, you can't just finish, especially with today's level of information, with, to, to appreciate, right, something. Uh, you would think knowing closer events is easier, but not always. Right, and for the past we just know dramatically less, so sometimes it seems easier, but that's where you should refine yourself, and there is a balance between the known and unknown that can tell us um, something more or less concrete. Now, I won't digress too much on this, but um, um, it's just, again, not for everyone. And it's it's something I fear will be lost because I don't think it's ever been gotten completely, even by those who should have some. So that you immediately, of course, um, recognize somebody who has received an actual military education. This is not to say that they don't have a strategic intelligence or capacity, but again, it mostly applies to certain contexts, and it. Um, sometimes says even obvious things. I, I, I hear often generals talking even in you know, podcasts, etc. They they make pretty, I mean, they're common mortals, right? They make pretty, um, after all, simple points. They're spot on, and it's difficult sometimes to even spot on in, in a precise way or to have a sense of what is going on. Um, that is what they mostly get in practice, but it's also very... Uh, Let's say um, it, it derives from the knowledge of a complexity they they went through, mostly appreciating the the value of things like training, doctrine, uh, say all the support you can get, uh, also in a non-strategic way, as we've seen. So it's again everything gets down to politics, but um, there is a technical side of the story that is uh, not technologistic but technical that. Uh, is worth appreciating. In any case, for today, I stop it here. I, I hope to have answered, uh, say, the due for, for this video. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.